So for our first main stage live stream edition, it brings me such joy to welcome Adam Grant in a talk about the future of work in conversation with Candace Factor. Adam is one of the world's most sought after thought leaders. He is the 10 most influential management thinkers of our time. He's a best-selling author, warden professor, TED Talk speaker. If you have not seen his TED Talk, you need to check it out. Over 15 million views. He is a leading organizational psychologist. His podcast, uh, Work Life, is super engaging, and you should definitely check that out. There was no one that we wanted to partner more with than Candace Factor. She's a pillar of our community. Her Game, Sa Game Changer sessions are launching live today as part of the main stage. So we're really excited to help her launch that. Uh, we both believe that radical collaboration creates greater value. So excited to have you on board. Candice, you are a pillar of our community, uh, the founder of Factory Ventures, the global GM of Wattpad. She is the, a big believer in the power of community. In fact, she was instrumental to be a part of the founding team that created Elevate way back in 2017. And we're super excited to welcome her to the inaugural Elevate Main Stage live stream edition, Candace. Awesome. Thanks so much, Razor. And I'm so delighted to be here uh, partnering with you to launch what we're doing called Game Changer Sessions. And really, this is the ethos of this is when all of this started to happen, I just thought to myself, I want to bring the most brilliant minds and kindest hearts to our community to help us really face this unprecedented level of change and uncertainty. And of course, uh, the first person who I thought of when I thought of a brilliant mind and a kind and you know a kind heart uh, is Adam Grant. And so when I reached out to Adam. Uh, saying, I really want to put a series together of thought leaders that can help. Um, not only did he say yes, he responded within three minutes. And that just is like a typical Adam Grant move. And so, Razor, you did a phenomenal job of introducing Adam. Uh, I mean, the only other thing I would like to say is Adam has really played an instrumental role in helping me think about my career and my life and what's important. And so I'm hugely honored to be here with Adam today. Um, Adam, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Thank you, Candice. Thrilled to be here. Uh, this is, I guess, the closest I can get to Canada right now. So thanks for having me virtually. <laughs> Awesome. It's great to have you virtually. Oh, there you are. Great. Um, so let's dive right in. I mean, as an organizational psychologist, this must be like, you're going to be researching this most probably for a huge part of the rest of your career. Um, you know, to just set the context, on March 10th, I was about to get on a plane to visit our mutual friend, actually the person who introduced us, David Hornick, in San Francisco. Uh -huh. And it seemed like a fine idea. And 48 hours later, it seemed insane, right? Like you would not get on that plane. And so the world has really shifted in the last month into a completely new reality. Um, remote work, social distancing, massive panic, new economic reality, shortage of PPE, I mean, where do we even begin in this conversation? I thought the first thing I'd love to ask you is just how has this impacted you uh, personally and also, you know, your students and the companies you're working with? Candice, yeah, it's, it's such a characteristically kind and thoughtful question to ask. You know, to be honest, it's probably affected me less than a lot of people. I've been working from home for almost two decades now. And so it, it hasn't changed my daily routine all that much, although I'm not traveling and I'm not finding excuses to not go into campus for meetings like I used to. No, right. I think in, in a lot of ways, the biggest change for me has just been wondering how the knowledge that I have might be helpful more broadly. And mm -hmm. I think it's tricky to figure out. It seems like a lot of the knowledge that's needed is around healthcare and medical and scientific expertise. Uh, and, you know, as a social scientist, I don't have a lot to contribute there. As I've been watching, you know, it affect companies and, uh, and also my students, I've, I've, I guess I've noticed a couple of things. 
One is that, that students in most cases are just really sad to miss out on graduating, those who are seniors. Yeah, and sure. they, they feel like they're gonna, they're gonna leave college having missed out on a big part of senior year. There's a lot of FOMO there. And sure. one of my tips to them is you, you can't control what you're gonna miss out on. What you yeah. can do though is you can recognize that you're missing out on, on bad things as well as good things. And so you should make a, a JOMO list, which is the joy of missing out. I love that. So for them, I, I wrote a list of, of things I'm thrilled to be missing. Uh, one is I love that I don't have to change out of sweatpants. Uh, <laughs> this is true. I, I don't have to commute anywhere. I'm enjoying the fact that I don't have to have awkward conversations with strangers. And I've also had fewer awkward conversations with actual people I know. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's a crisis is good in any way. But no, no experience is uniformly good or bad. Yeah. And recognize that in, in crisis, there can be some things that we enjoy or appreciate. Seems like a, a powerful step. And I would say the same exact thing to companies, right? Vir virtual work and remote work is hard in a lot of ways, but you could also reframe it as, okay, now I have more flex time, which I've always wanted, or now I have more family time. And that's something I, I've always been thrilled to carve out. So that, that to me is maybe a starting point. I don't know, Candace, how is it affecting you? No, that's a, that's a great starting point. I mean, I think the biggest thing is remote work is, is actually new for me. Uh, I enjoy going into an office every day. Uh, my office looks really nice right now, but it's actually like a piece of my bedroom, to be really honest. I could show you in a second. Um, I have my kids at home. Uh, I, I'm finding it different. And I think, um, you know, that's kind of what I want to get into is like this idea of remote work for certain people is very common. And then for others, it's like a whole new reality, especially for large organizations who weren't used to remote work. So, you know, I'd love to kind of understand, have you done any research on sort of remote work as it relates to productivity, happiness, results? Is there anything you want to share for people around how to think about remote work and the impact this is going to have? Yeah, I, so I, I haven't done it myself, but I've spent a lot of time reading brilliant work by lots of colleagues in organizational psychology and management and sociology and even economics. I'll, I'll highlight a few things that have been useful for me. The first is to recognize that not only is this not all bad, there are ways that it can be beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, so the economists did this experiment where in call centers, people were randomly assigned to have the chance to work from home as opposed to going into the office. And on average, Activity went up by 13%. And over the next six months, they were half as likely to quit as they would have been before. Wow. So the big question is what's driving that effect? And I, I have three hypotheses. One is that there's a sense of loyalty and trust that comes from being mm -hmm. allowed to work from home. Managers micromanage less, they monitor less, people appreciate having that freedom, and they reciprocate it by, by working maybe a little bit harder. A second is that the people now have the flexibility to work in, in places and in ways and in times that work for them, which in the office, they maybe found it harder to do. And then the last possibility is when, when people have the chance to work from home, uh, they actually made different kinds of connections. So instead of just having to interact with the people who happen to sit next to them, they were able to reach out to the people that shared their values or who they could learn from. And I, I think we can see all those effects right now. Now, yeah. there are costs, right? We know it's a lot harder, for example, to share ideas when you're not sitting face to face with somebody else. But here, I think some research by Anita Woolley and her colleagues is really instructive. Uh, what they did was they studied software teams that were having to collaborate virtually. And they found that teams were more creative and more productive when they were online at the same time. Uh, they experienced a pattern that, that Anita and her colleagues called burstiness which is the sense that the, the collaboration is literally bursting with energy and ideas, which is, is hard to do from a distance. And I thought the reason that being in sync uh, was so helpful was that they were able to build on each other's ideas, right? So Candace, if you and I are, are online at the same time, I can send you a thought and then you can, you, know, you can immediately elaborate on it and give me some great suggestions. And then we're able to move a lot more efficiently and bounce things back and forth. That may be true, but in Anita's data, there's a, a different mechanism at play which is people are energized by the fact that they know someone else is responding to them. So if I'm a software engineer and I'm writing some code, the fact that I know you're online waiting to receive it, it's kind of exciting, right? I feel like my, my work matters for somebody beyond myself. 
And so I guess, you know, to the extent that it's possible, it's really helpful to sync our schedules at least for a couple hours a day. I love that. I think, first of all, just the reframe of like remote work and the research on how productive and how positive it can be for people, I think is super, super helpful. And then I think what you say is like really powerful, which is just we're going to reimagine ways to have uh, creativity and connection. Uh, one area I'm really interested in is trust. How does trust get impacted by virtual work? And how do you build new relationships? Like I'm really, I know you already and I've met you in person and that's how we connected. And then it's easy to take relationships online. What happens when you're meeting people for the first time online? How do you build, what tips do you have actually to build a level of trust? Oh, uh, that's such a fun question to think about. Um, it's timely too, because next my podcast episode is gonna be on loneliness. So we've been trying to, we, we actually, we decided for work life about six months ago that we were going to do an episode on loneliness and it's obviously become timely in a way that we didn't anticipate and we also wish weren't the case. As a result, we've been rethinking some of the pieces of it to try to make sure that it's relevant to the current situation we're all in. And one of my favorite exercises that seems to port pretty well is to build what's called a rapid high quality connection. This comes from a mentor of mine, Jane Dutton, who spent her whole career studying relationships. And one of the things she assigns her students to do is to just pair up with a stranger and take one minute to try to build a high quality connection with them. She doesn't give them any directions. They don't know exactly what they're supposed to do. She just says, right. go meet this person, try to hit it off. And I've done this a number of times, not only with students, but also in companies. And people are stunned by how good they are at it. Uh, they, they quickly realize they have some intuitive or learned skills for, for building connections right off the bat. And I think what, this is especially important when we're trying to connect with people virtually. So I think there are probably, there are three ways that I've seen people do this effectively that are supported by data. The first one would be self-disclosure, just sharing something about yourself that might be unusual or personal. So I might tell people that I once took a bus from Boston to Mexico City. Uh, and back, which I would never wish on anyone, uh, and I will never do again, but I did. Uh, and you immediately then would be like either, okay, I have a question for this person, or this person is insane. Right. Um, second, the second thing that seems to be powerful is uh, to show curiosity about yourself. So Candace, I might ask you a question that really encourages you to open up. Like, what's, uh, what's a passion that you would love to pursue in five or ten years? Uh, what was your favorite hobby when you were a child? Uh, who's your closest friend and what do you admire most about them, right? Things that I don't know about you. Sure. And then the final strategy that seems to work is building uncommon uh, commonalities. So mm -hmm. identifying things that you share that are rare. Uh, it's, it, I guess the, the analogy for me, Candice, is imagine you meet someone from your hometown in your hometown. It doesn't really, it doesn't affect you in any way, shape or form. You're like, well, there are a lot of people from here right, right now. So that's easy to find. But if you're traveling abroad, and you meet someone who grew up in the same town as you, you have this like, instant. Mind. Sure. Yeah. Wow, we were it. meant to meet, we're like, best friends. So totally. Uh, that that's actually that's super helpful. And in fact, you know, that would be a great prompt for people uh in uh in Zoom, just some questions I'm thinking to to ask to get to know people. What have you been um, asking as you meet people virtually? Yeah, I mean, I think for me virtually, anyway. um, why are you talking to strangers? I, I was going to say the interesting thing is I haven't done that much talking to strangers yet. And I think that actually brings up, you know, another conversation that I wanted to dive into, which is, you know, I think at a time like this, people are really trying to focus on giving. And I'm going to come back to how we can give more in organizations, because I know that that's actually how you and I connected, was all the work you did around generosity and this idea of givers being both at the bottom of organizations and at the top of organizations. But going back to this idea of um, what you're saying, meeting new people, how do we think about managing this relationship in a crisis when it comes to selling, right? And actually new pipeline or new people or meeting new people. Um, is it different when people are in both a crisis and with remote work, how we should think about selling and, and making these new connections? And maybe actually some of this advice is, is useful for that too. But should we think about that differently in a time of crisis? 
uh, where where people are you know trying to wrap their heads around the impact of this. It's a really good question, Candice. My my first reaction is I don't know. I would I would love to see some data on that question. Uh, I mm -hmm. haven't seen a whole bunch on virtual selling. I haven't seen much of it in the context of crisis either. My guess is that. You know, in, in some ways, one of my mentors, Richard Hackman, used to say that teams were like amplifiers, and whatever you put in a team comes out louder. And I wonder if if crises are that way too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess as as I think about what I know about effective sales, uh, Dan Pink has argued very convincingly, drawing together a lot of evidence that when when we sell today, it's much more about problem identification than it is problem solving. That mm -hmm. salespeople first and have to figure out what their customers need. And then once they've, they've been, become clear about that, they can often lead the customer to their own solution. So I, that seems to me to be an example of something that's magnified in crisis. To say that, okay, now it's even more important than it was before to sit down if you're gonna, if you're gonna reach out to a potential customer or client and say, hey, Candice, uh, I'd actually love to hear what are your biggest challenges right now. Uh, right. I have no idea if I can solve any of them, but if nothing else, it might give me more clarity on my challenges. And it'll give me some data that I can bring back to my company. And the hope is then that, you know, that there's a, a problem or a need that, that gets surfaced that maybe I can help with. But if not, I've learned something and maybe you've actually crystallized some of your own thinking too. I, I think that's so helpful. And to add what you said before, which is then how do you actually build that rapport by getting to know someone? Um, I was laughing because I know... Weren't you an Olympic swimmer or a springboard diver? And I was wondering if you would think that the picture in the background was intentional for you. Uh, so, so that is something. Well, well chosen. Yeah, as a, as a former diver, I could barely swim far enough to get from where I hit the water to the side of the pool. So I, I have no sense of camaraderie with you right now at all. <laughs> there you go. So not a good one. But um, no, I think that's really, really helpful because for a lot of organizations, they're really trying to grapple with what does this mean for sales and marketing? I think those are the areas that are really going to struggle in, in, the, in, the, in the immediate future because nobody wants to look like they're selling. You know, they really want to focus on giving and or um, helping. And so actually, I want to go back to giving because I think this is one of the most important times that we need to have a mindset of helping and of giving. And what I love about your work uh, is you talk about in companies, there's often paranoia, you know, and, and anxiety in companies that cause people to, you know, be pretty stressed out and maybe sometimes giving gets compromised. And, and you talk a little bit about something called pronoia. I love all your terms. Can you talk about how companies can really help people give and how companies can give more and better and create environments of giving? What, what do we need to be doing? Yeah. Well, for, first, Candice, I would say full credit to Fred Goldner for coining the term pronoia and then Brian Little for giving me my favorite definition of it, which is the delusional belief that other people are plotting your well-being. Uh, like they're going around behind your back and saying extremely nice things about you. How dare they? I, I think if we, if we can build cultures of, of generosity in organizations, that pronoia stops being a delusion and it becomes your reality. Right? Givers are actually the people who are trying to enhance your well-being, even if you haven't asked. One of the things I worry about a lot, especially in a crisis, is we have a lot of frustrated givers in our workplaces who would be thrilled to help if only they knew who could benefit and how. And I, mm -hmm. I've seen this in a bunch of companies I've been working with over the past few weeks, as well as with, uh, with my alumni, where people are reaching out saying, look, if, you know, if, like I felt, if I'm not a doctor, if I'm not a scientist, if I don't have access to, you know, warehouse with a lot of PPE, what can I do to step up and contribute? Right. And I think one of the best answers to that question is to say, okay, if we want cultures of, of generosity and helping in organizations, we need to build cultures of help seeking where people can ask for what they need. And as you make people's needs and problems more transparent, it's much easier for to step up and say, oh, I know someone or something that could actually help here. 
So a couple of years ago, um, I, I was asked to, to get involved in co-founding this exercise that went online. It's called Givitas. Uh, and you may know Givitas, Candice, is a knowledge sharing platform that, that's designed to make it easy to seek and give help on five minutes a day or less. And yeah. I have been floored by what's happened in the past few weeks in Givitas. So we have communities inside companies, we have them in universities. And all you do is you go in and you submit a request for something you want or need on your own. And then everybody else in your community is, is there to try to pitch in and give whatever they can to, to help fulfill your request. And I think it's a great way to surface what other people need and to, to give people a chance to step up as well. So would love to see more people organizing at that kind of scale as opposed to saying, you know what, most of our giving and helping happens person to person. Why not right. instead craft this request so we can find the best expert or the most qualified source of support? No, I, I, that's a fantastic idea. And just the notion of like really giving people ways to be helpful in organizations, I think is really, really useful for people. But here's what I'm interested in is often, you know, your research around givers came out that givers often perform both, you know, at the lowest end in companies, like they get taken advantage of sometimes, I would I would, you know, dare to say, and as well at the highest end of companies. And I think in times when there's a crisis or stress, I bet you those people are the ones giving the most. And in one of your work-life episodes that I think is so, you know, important right now in the world, you talk a lot about burnout and stress. And so, you know, when you talk about our frontline healthcare workers, and they're really the people, you know, who are in massive need right now, I get really worried about the stress and anxiety and burnout on these people and even in companies, you know, where the, the givers are giving too much. What do these people need to do to make sure they are able to cope, right? And this is both the frontline healthcare workers and people in companies. And what do organizations need to do to make sure that these people, you know, are, are okay, that actually they actually don't get burnt out? Um, any any thoughts on on that? Yeah, let, let's talk at the individual level and the organizational level. So as far as individuals are concerned, I think what most givers need to recognize is that we have to engage in self-care, not just care for others. Uh, I found that the givers who sacrifice themselves um, and are high in concern for other people but low in concern for themselves are more vulnerable to burnout and more vulnerable also to get exploited because people will say, oh, that person loves to help. Let's just dump every task we have now on their plate. And pretty soon, no good deed goes unpunished. Right. I think setting boundaries means being thoughtful about who you help, when you help, and how you help. And setting aside time to get your own work done, to take care of your family, to exercise, right? to connect with the people who energize you as opposed to deflate you. And I think those steps are important. At an organizational level, probably my favorite model of fighting burnout uh, is called demand control support, as you know, Candice. Uh, mm -hmm. And the idea is that we can, we can try to fight burnout through structural and cultural changes. The first, the first change is about demand, saying we need to reduce the, the workload or the stress that people face. That might mean shorter shifts. It might mean, uh, you know, to some extent, figuring out what tasks can be delegated away from uh, a primary care provider so that they can focus on people who are in more urgent need. Then the second component is, is control, saying, look, you know, there's some demands we can't take away, right? We can't stop people from getting sick. We can't stop them from needing ventilators. What we can do though, is we can give caregivers more control over how they navigate those demands. And mm -hmm. that might mean, uh, it might mean teaching them to approach a conversation with a patient a different way. So that, uh, so that patients are a little bit more flexible in their requests. It might mean letting them make some choices about what unit they're on or what hours they come in, which I know is not always practical, but we can look for those opportunities on the margin. And then the last part is support to say, okay, one of the, the most meaningful acts of giving that any of us can engage in is actually caring for the caregivers right. and asking, okay, who are the people on the front lines who are at the, the most risk of burnout? And how can I make sure that they feel like I have their back? Uh, how can I make sure, for example, if you have a spouse, who's going in uh, to do health or safety work, uh, you then immediately take on, okay, I'm gonna manage the homeschooling of our kids or their online learning platforms. I'm gonna cook dinner and make sure that they don't have the same burdens at home that they do when they're at work. Uh, and that, I guess, is where I would start. 
I, th I think that's so incredibly helpful. And I know, you know, even as citizens, we can all show how we care about our frontline healthcare workers. And so, you know, I would argue a lot of your work is super relevant, you know, uh, for this crisis right now, because that feels like a really, really big pain point, which is helping these frontline healthcare workers. And I think all of us can do that through a lot of small acts of kindness. Um, and so I don't think I have much more time, but I have like two questions left for you um, before we open this up to, to the rest. Um, you have kids, I know, uh, three beautiful kids, and I'm assuming you're used to having them at home with you. For many of us, this is new for us, and we're trying to figure out like, what the hell do I do with my kids during this? Um, both so that this experience is a positive one for them, and two, uh, like really, how much screen time is like not going to brain damage my child right now? And I'm laughing because I think in one of your TED Talks, you have this awesome picture of you as like a five-year-old kid. And I think the line was something like, um, I have it somewhere, the death, uh, hang on one second. I, I had it somewhere. Now it's gone, obviously. Um, anyway, maybe you can talk about it, but but it's something as it relates to spending way too much time on Nintendo games. So can you <laughs> talk a little bit about how we should be thinking about screens right now and also um, what this experience means for our kids and how we can use it? I can try. Well, I, th I think the first thing is screen time is the wrong vocabulary, right? When, if you go back to the 1980s, the, the reason I ended up on that newspaper was my mom was freaked out that I was playing on the weekend, sometimes six or seven hours of Nintendo a day. And she felt like it was, you know, I got really cranky after I played and it was freeze drying my brain or something as I was freeze drying characters in Metroid for those of you who are old enough to remember it. And, you know, we, people were so worried about video games and before that it was TV and now it's social media and screens are not necessarily the problem, right? It's the way we engage with them. Mm -hmm. So my reason is that if there's a problem with screen time, it's passive screen time, not active screen time. So the first thing I would do is if you're going to set a limit, don't limit the overall number of hours on screen, limit the number of hours you spend just staring at the screen, right? As opposed to interacting with it. You know, in that sense, I like a video game much better than watching the fourth movie of the day <laughs> because there's some challenge there. Uh, there's even maybe a little bit of mental and physical activity that goes on and you can build resilience. I, I know as I, I watch our kids when they lose in video games, uh, it reminds me of being a kid and finding the, the determination and resolve to say, you know what, I'm super frustrated right, right now, but I'm not going to give up until I beat this game. Uh, so that, that to me is the, the first thing I would do. I guess the, my the sons butter... are going to love you after this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can blame me. It's totally my, it's yeah, totally my fault, Ken. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, I, yeah, I, I think we should get rid of screen time as, as, as an issue altogether and say, okay, let's set limits on different kinds of activities. Uh, I think the second thing is we can also create rewards and say, mm -hmm. look, you know, if you're on top of your, you know, of your, of your homework, uh, or if you do something educational, then you can earn more screen time. And there's, there's no reason that these limits need to be fixed at all. Uh, awesome. More broadly, I think, you know, what does this mean for our kids? I think it's way too early to tell. Uh, I do know from a fair amount of research on resilience in general that what kids seem to need when they go through crisis uh, is, you know, assuming that they're, they're physically safe and protected, they need a sense that they matter which is the feeling that other people notice them, care about them, and rely on them. And my observation has been that most parents are doing a pretty good job on the first two, right? Paying attention to their kids and you know, unconditional love. I think what's often missing is that third part, which is children need to feel relied upon. And especially when they're separated from their friends, they're not at school, it's hard to feel like they make a difference or that they can be helpful. And so I think this is a great opportunity for us as parents to actually consult our kids and go to them for advice. So one of the things that, that I ended up doing recently was I was, uh, I was having a hard time setting up my, uh, my web display actually for a video conference like this. And I went to our 11-year-old and I asked for help. And she was so excited to be able to contribute. Uh, 
Uh, and, you know, then of course she makes fun of me because I know less about technology than she does. And I work with a lot of tech companies, but I guess that is the way of the world. Uh, but it, it just reminded me that, you know, as parents, there are steps we can take to, to give our kids chances to be helpful um, and to show them that, that what they have to offer is actually of value to other people. I, that's so, so true um, and great advice. And so I um, I think we're running out of time. I could just check with people. I, I think this is, um, that's it from, from me. I, I, Adam, I could sit and talk to you for another three hours and not run out of questions, but we have an amazing uh, a number of people who are on this call. So I uh, am gonna hand it over. To Razor, who is going to invite people to ask questions. And first, I just want to say thank you so much, Adam. I'm going to come back and thank you in a minute, but I'm going to let uh, Razor take over and let the audience ask you some great questions. All right. Before awesome. we do that, Candice, I just want to say thank you for your generosity. Uh, you've you've helped so many people in my orbit. I can hardly keep track, but especially for me, I got to see this up close recently when I wanted to do a podcast episode on procrastination. And I had this dream of getting Margaret Atwood and Candace, you not only said I've met her, you went and introduced me to her and got her lined up for the episode, which was a huge <laughs> treat. Thank you for that. Well, it's so my pleasure. And I'm coming back to thank you in a minute. I'm going to let some other people have, uh, have some of your time. Thanks, Adam. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you both, uh, Adam and Candace. There's a lot of thanking going on here. It feels like very generous uh, <laughs> spirits today. Uh, you know, when uh, you guys were talking about sales and revenue and this opportunity of just, you know, how to approach that, it really resonated with me. And as we think about Elevate, you know, our goal is to just how do we add value? How do we be good partners? Um, and we'll worry about the revenue later. We know that if we do the right thing, if we lead from the front, if we lead from our heart, that those memories, especially in times of crisis, tend to be sticky and that karma works. So I would just encourage people, it was nice to hear your validation around that approach. We just want to be helpful with the ad value. So thank you for sharing that with me. Now we've got so many questions. I'm only going to be able to get to like five of them. Okay, the first question is for Adam. It's from Jody. In the, in the time of physical distancing and many work cultures having to move to a work from home culture, uh, you know, given the time frame that this is going to take, how do you see corporate cultures being impacted when we do beat this, when we do get back to work in our normal office cultures? What, what changes? How does this have a long-term impact? Oh, it's such a dangerous activity to try to predict the future. Right? There's an old <laughs> saying, historians can't even predict the past. But <laughs> try to honor the spirit of the question. I think the first yeah. thing that's is we're going to see more flexible workplaces when we come back. Right? There are leaders who before were opposed to the idea of letting people work from home. But we're going to say, you know what, a day or so a week, there's no reason why we can't allow people to do that in a lot of organizations and a lot of industries. And I think that's something we can look forward to. I think the other thing that's probably going to change is people are going to appreciate human connection in a way that we didn't before. I've seen in some companies, people are doing virtual home office tours uh, where they'll, they'll literally go around and say, okay, you know, this is my space. This is the closet in which I'm working. Here are my pictures of my kids. And it's fostered a, you know, a sense of, of real unique human connection. And I think people are going to be craving that when they're able to go back and finally be physically close to each other. So those are probably the two biggest changes I feel comfortable forecasting, but uh, take those with a grain of salt. Yeah, no, I smile. We launched uh, our culture and social committee launched Elevate Cribs, where they will walk you through their uh, abode uh, and you kind of get to see what it's like. It's, it's such a human connection, right? To see Amazing. In context. Yeah. Okay. This next question is uh, from Jackie. What are some of the strategies, whether it's from your own experience or from your research, that people can uh, use to stay productive and motivated while working from home? Oh, all right. This we could we could have a long conversation about this one. I'll uh, I'll suggest a couple of things, uh, and then maybe a couple of resources to check out. So the first thing is, I think time management is not the solution. It's part of the problem. We only have a certain number of hours in in a day, and the more we obsess about time management the more we notice how many hours we waste. And then we start to beat ourselves up for that. And we get into this spiral of, of shame and guilt and self-loathing. And it's, it's really unpleasant for everyone involved. What I prefer is attention management. 
which is to say, okay, given the hours I have, how do I make sure that my attention is locked in to the projects and focused on the people that really matter to me? And I think you could break down attention management more systematically by saying, okay, that means I've got to figure out which projects are interesting to me and meaningful to others. And I have to make sure those are scheduled in my, in my calendar so that I have adequate time for those. I've got to also think about where I work, where my attention is focused and I'm able to find flow as opposed to constantly being interrupted and distracted. And I think some of that is inevitable, right? We are all BBC dad now. We all have our kids <laughs> dancing into our Zooms. Um, and I'm going to it hasn't happened here yet. But, you know, there are places where we can probably work with more concentration and more focus than, than other places. And then the last part of attention management for me is really about when we work effectively. Uh, as a morning person, I used to do all my creative work first thing because I thought that's when I'm most alert. I want my best thinking. And then I read some research showing that we're actually more creative off our circadian rhythms because creativity requires not our thinking. It requires unexpected leaps. And so at night when I'm a little bit foggier, I'm now more likely to spend half an hour brainstorming about a new article or a new podcast episode. Uh, and I think those kinds of experiments, adjusting when you do certain kinds of tasks, are a great way to figure out what makes you productive and then tailor your schedule to the newfound flexibility that you have. And I guess I'd say for anybody who's interested in more on that, uh, this, this podcast episode I did with Margaret Atwood is called The Real Reason You Procrastinate on Work Life. <laughs> we looked at how to manage the emotions that get us stuck in a pattern of, of putting things off uh, and how to maintain some degree of focus and productivity. So. Hope there's something useful there. Razor, back to you. <laughs> awesome, that's great. Awesome. Uh, our next question is both for Adam and Candice. It's from Shamir. He wanted you guys to comment on the current job situation or, or lack thereof, right? In the US, we're seeing numbers of 10 million plus in the last two weeks. Canada, we're seeing about a million people being laid off. It is unprecedented throughout history of seeing this many people without employment. What do you see are the most promising job prospects? Where should candidates be focusing their time and attention? Candace, what do you think? <laughs> Good one. Uh, great, uh, really great question. And I would say two things. So one, the world is not gonna be in COVID lockdown forever. And I think a huge number of job losses are as a result of social distancing. And then there are going to be job losses as a result of us entering a recession or likely entering this recession um, and a bunch of companies not being able to bounce back. And so, you know, I, I think the places to look for jobs are really um, industries and companies that are, t are really poised well for virtual connection. And obviously, technology companies like Zoom like uh, anybody who is helping us connect digitally are really interesting. Obviously, that's a small group, but you know, this is going to be a force function for innovation and companies that actually help people um, do their work in a more digital way. So I would definitely focus on the technology industry. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that you know, the, the industry that's being hit least hard or the sector that's being hit least hard right now is knowledge work. Right? Yeah. Knowledge workers in, in many industries have been already working remotely for decades. And so this feels like a decent time to take a coding class, right? If you don't know how to code yet. Um, it feels like a really good time to figure out how you can get up to speed on what's known about, uh, let's say, data visualization. Um, I'm seeing marketing companies with desperate needs to bring their data to life uh, so that they can communicate internally and also share what's going on with their customers. Um, and I feel like data, data visualization jobs are still growing, uh, at least from what I've seen. I'd like to see better data on that, ironically. Maybe someone will, will bring a chart by the end of this conversation, but <laughs> I, would, um, I would look to those kinds of knowledge work jobs that are, still, that are still expanding and figure out, okay, in the next few weeks, are there some skills that I can pick up? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, this was our most popular question on Zoom. It was by Nergi, so over to you, Adam. How do you envision the new world changing? Sorry, how do you envision the world changing? Or do you have any predictions on shifting new realities or habits that'll form? Huh. Um, well, look, I, I think it's so early, it's very hard to say. Uh, I think the, I, I might shift the question a little bit and say instead of a prediction, 
What's my hope? One of my hopes is that we actually reimagine the school day to align with the work day. Mm -hmm. I think it is insane that kids go to school often two hours before parents start work, and then they come home two hours before parents end work. And the fact that we still have a, you know, a school calendar that's in some way matched to you know, hours of daylight for a largely mm -hmm. farming or agricultural economy just does not make sense in the present. And so my hope is that you know, as people experiment and experience online schooling and learning, that we're actually gonna reimagine that. <laughs> Say, you know what, school day should be nine to five or work day should be seven to three, whatever they are, they ought to be in sync. They're in sync right now. There's no reason they shouldn't be in sync when we go back to some aspects of life as we know. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Some of our best practices are such antiquated from the industrial age or even the agricultural age, and we haven't shifted those into sort of a, a modern society. Okay, well, that is all the time that we have today. Didn't I promise yeah. you how great this conversation was gonna be? <laughs> Didn't Adam and Candace crush it? You are definitely my favorite uh, guests on the Elevate Main Stage live stream edition. It is true, it's the first one. So uh, thank you so much for your time, your generosity, your wisdom. You guys continue to over deliver. We are so grateful at Elevate and our community uh, for, for all the insight you guys provided. Candace, over to you. Thanks so much, Razor. So first off, thanks, Razor, for having us on the Elevate main stage live stream. It's really amazing to be here. And there is no one else I would have wanted to kick this off with other than Adam. So a huge thank you to you, Adam. I, I honestly believe that the world is truly a better place with so many of your ideas in it. I think more organizations, more leaders, more humans, more parents need to have access to your incredible amount of research that you're doing around living more generous, creative, and meaningful lives, and especially in this time of crisis. Uh, your work really has helped me think about how I want to live in the face of uncertainty and change, and also how I want to create the future, a future that we actually want, so very much like your hope. Um, so two things. So as a token of appreciation, uh, at Game Changer, we wanted to make a donation to help people actually in Canada do what you were talking about. So to actually help bring care packages and care to more of our healthcare workers. So we will definitely be doing that. And also just helping people with mental health as it relates to stress and anxiety. Um, and we uh, are also um, quite involved in something called the ppedrive.com. So we will be um, also donating money there for you. So thank you very, very much uh, for, for joining us today. Um, no, thank you, Candice, for, for hosting me, for asking such interesting questions, for being overly generous in your praise, and also a huge thanks to Razor for bringing together such a dynamic community of original thinkers. Uh, Razor, you're a con con few others, and it's a, it's a treat to see you. Awesome. For, uh, for nice once. to see you as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Adam. And just before um, I go, I also want to just do two things. So one, um, Game Changer Sessions is new. We're so delighted to have partnered with Elevate for our first one. And it's very appropriate that I tell you who our next guest is. Um, actually, it's the uh, other slide, so I'm waiting for them to change the slide, um, is actually our friend, Margaret Atwood, uh, who is going to be talking to us um, about the future. And, uh, you know, I think what's so amazing about this is uh, I know Margaret from my days at Wattpad. And Wattpad, we used to call Margaret the fairy godmother of Wattpad. And what I got to know about Margaret is not only is she Canada's most emin eminent novelist and poet, and obviously highly acclaimed uh, story <clears throat> literary voice. Uh, she is a prophetic futurist, as we all know. And back in the day, um, she was talking about virtual signings, and they could not be more relevant than this moment. So very excited to have uh, Margaret Atwood on the next Game Changer session. So you can sign up uh, at www.gamechanger.co. And a huge thank you to Elevate uh, for hosting us and for bringing this community together. And together, we're so much stronger. So thank you very, very much. And Razor, as the co-founder of Elevate and a friend of yours, I love what you're doing. And Adam, thank you again for joining.